I remember he was, I remember he was lying in uh, Sloan Kettering and he said to me, Avi, I could buy this hospital a few times, but they can't help me. That's uh, something I'll never forget, he said. But at one point in 1987, uh, he called me into his office and he handed me a check. Uh, and he said, do you want to look at the check? I said, not really. I didn't ask for it. He said, look at the check. And it was made out for a million dollars in 1987. Wow. That was even more than yeah. now. And I said, what's this for, Zalman? He said, if you'll go to Tel Aviv this year to start a synagogue, that's my founder's contribution. It was in 1987, and it's not well known. Chaim was then the rabbi in the shul ruby, and we thought about it for a while, but you know, the shul was, it was, was in its, its growth stage. I often think about that. So just, uh, it's, it's beautiful to be they, here. They, with wouldn't, they wouldn't have appreciated you, Avi. Maybe. Yeah, uh, I feel, um, you know, we feel, thank God in Riverdale, we always felt very appreciated, very unusual rabbinic. As a matter of fact, this Thursday night, I'm giving a session to 12, there are 12 rabbis um, in a Chovave program who are rabbis in Israel, and they are learning the Chovave way of being a rabbi. These, these are rabbis who don't need help in deciphering a piece of Chumash or the Talmud or Jewish law, but there's something about learning leadership, professionalism, pastoral care. And uh, I'm looking forward to meeting with them. This is a third cohort. And there are many, many now students in Maharat, the women's rabbinical school who are from Israel, women who are very advanced with some of them have PhDs in Talmud. Some have clerked for the Supreme Court justices, so really know what's called Mishpat Ivri. So they really know the, the Israeli legal law and they're very, very versed. Anat Sherbat, who we're gonna see next week, she has a doctorate in Talmud. She reads the Talmud like I read the sports section of some mm -hmm. newspaper. And it's really something something to see a lot to be proud of very proud i did want to dedicate this session to charlotte cohen who passed at the age of 99 the funeral will be tomorrow morning and she always kept me on my toes i remember the first time i met her goes back almost 50 years she was there in the beginning and there was some rally and it was a complicated difficult rally and she walked up to me and she said ah this is a rally i remember jabotinsky i remember kahana this is nothing this is this is minor league stuff and she was really she was a wonderful woman who meant a lot to all of us but a quick hello to everyone so ellen how are we doing things are good manage <laughs> managing yeah. i hear it is getting cold now in new york because here today it hit 70 73 really nice howard how are you feeling I'm feeling okay right now thank you rabbi uh, that's great that's good morning wonderful. rabbi morning we're on the phone seymour and sarah oh how are you seymour and sarah i'm going we're okay well. yeah, yeah you had them I don't announce it, but we've taken every class of yours practically. Well, I, I, yeah, it's it's so good to hear your voice, Ruth. How are we doing? Are oh, you on mute, Ruth? Got to unmute yourself. Ruth, you have to unmute your. You have to unmute. I'm doing just fine, thank you. Always good to see you. Good, Ruth. Really. Yeah, you look wonderful. That's great. And um, yeah, I go back with Ruth a long time. I think the first time we met Ruth was where? Was it at the 
Rosh Hashanah. And we went to Israel. Oh, we went to Israel. Right. We went to Israel when um, the Sparrow attacked. Sorry? What year did you come to Israel with me? 91. Wow. Was Wasn't that when we were, were we stoned then? Yes, yes, yes. The bus was stoned. It was the a very eventful trip. Wonderful memory. Remember? Our first so what trip I remember to is that we were on our way out of the northern Samaria and the bus was stoned, the window shadowed right near David Eisenman. And our guide, Ira Rappaport, remember what he did? Yeah. What did he do? What are you doing? Shooting, shooting in the air. Shot in the air. You know, these stories are so wild, Ruth. Yeah. I often ask myself, did they really happen? Or am oh, I God. just making them up? But you said it. That's what I remember. I remember he jumped out and he they were throwing rocks and he, he shot into the air. And as soon as the bullets were shot, the stone throwing stopped. And then he jumped back in. And that was near Shoham. Near Shoham was so many it was bad near things Shohem. happened. Yeah, it was near Nablus. Yeah. Yep. And there was something. Ruby, how are you doing? Hi. I'm doing just fine. Thank you. Uh, Richard's uh, son, Andrew, just had an engagement party. Oh, wow. Getting married in March, right. Wow. Wow, that's beautiful. Yep. Mazel tov. Mazel Thank tov. You. Thank you. You keep account what number getting married now is this? Yes. <laughs> Quite a few. <laughs> Quite a few. That's a good answer. Yeah, right. I, I saw yesterday, I saw Yosef Mendelevich, who is a hero in our times. He's the one who tried to take a plane out of the Soviet Union mm -hmm. to wake up the world to the plight of Soviet Jewry. And he got 11 years in prison for that. Right. And um, and he told me that mm -hmm. the morning he it was at a Brit, and believe it or not, it was his 30th grandchild. He said, Yosef, wow. from the prisons of Patna, of Siberia, here you are in Israel with your 30th grandchild. It's wow. quite a story. Quite a story. Linda, how are you doing? Fine, thank you. Oh, it's so good to see you, Linda. Your heart is in Israel too, isn't it, Linda? Yeah, but we can't get there because we don't have any yeah. degree relatives. So we're yeah. waiting and we're waiting and hopefully maybe by another year December. So let us in. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. And I see Natalie's on. Hi, Natalie. Hi, Rabbi. How are you doing, Natalie? as well as can be expected for an old lady. You're not an old lady. Yes, I no. am. Well, you may want to, want to consider my, I'm getting older too. My father always said, there's a difference between getting older and getting old. And I like that. We all want to get older and we don't have to get old. And actually that's my, going to be my, an opening thought from this week's Parsha. So. And then I see my toe is on. Yeah, I told you know, him. When you were describing how you feel about Israel, I think your feeling is that of Shlemut. And that's what yeah. I used to feel when I could be in Israel. Yeah. yeah, it is that way. It's, uh, it's really where my heart and soul is so very much. Yeah. And I, I see other numbers on. I think Janet is on. Shane Alea Badkhana. Can you say a word, Shainalea, if you're on? I'm pretty sure you are. And who else is on? I know Judy Frank is on. Shalom, Rabbi. Hi, how are you doing? Thank God. Have you seen Karen Stahl Don? Not very far from where you I, are. I did see Karen uh, because um, I, I said a few words at Chaya Gorsedman's funeral. Fred's wife, and uh, Fred became very close to Stanley. 
uh, at one point, uh, Ruby, I don't know if you remember, used to come up and sit with Stanley, gaining from his wisdom. And yeah, so I did see, and we saw them at the Shiva as well. And uh, thank God they look, they look okay. Phil seems okay. And uh, we saw Esther Gelband briefly. Esther lost her husband recently. So, and then we're having something very interesting. This Saturday night, our daughter Ilana organized a coming together of all those who were at the Bayit at the Hebrew Institute who made Aliyah. And we oh, estimate that, that there are about 150 family units over wow. the 50 years, 45 years who made Aliyah, but we don't know where all of them are. And, and, um, and, and, and actually, I don't, I don't even know the names of all because some were at the Bayit for a year or two or what have you, but we're looking forward to that. And uh, someone walked in last Saturday night. They had the wrong Saturday night. Uh, uh, we're looking forward to that. And uh, so Judy Frank is on, and Jessica is on, and I don't, I don't see. Right, I don't see Arnie on. Maybe Arnie will get on. I'm here. Is Arnie on? Oh, Arnie. Now I see Arnie. I just, I just moved it a little bit. How are you, Arnie? Um. I just dream of the day when I, I will be in Israel and you will be in Israel at the same time and we'll, we'll be able to go around and you'll show me some right. of the wonderful, wonderful places. Yes. I know, mm -hmm. Arnie, that you would love to be here. And uh, yeah, I, 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 I wish there'd be a way you can come here, Arnie. I know you'd love to be here. And uh, I see Mendy is on. Was Mahde Mendy? How are you doing, my Mendy? Mendy Laufer is on. Thank you. Start and, now. Uh, Bert, Bert Nussbacher, who's really an exceptional, really Yodea Seifa. Great to Thank see you. you, Bert. It looks like you're in the planetarium. <laughs> yeah, well, this is a remnant from my uh, playing with my grandkids. I see. Yeah. Well, we Hello, we Brad, I so. I've often yeah. been called a space cadet, so there we go. Okay. <laughs> I can take, by the way, a little bit more time because Ezra's not on today. And Vivian, Hello, hi, Rabbi. Uh, yes, I'm, hi, I'm finally how... back home, so it's challenging to be here in my home. Oh, oh wow. But thank God. But you, look like you're, you look like you're a press correspondent. Uh, I don't know. It's, so uh, you're, you're, I, I put my earphones on because there's noise around. Oh, so you're in the Parkway House now? Yes, I am. I'm here in the Parkway House. And it was my first Shabbos at, uh, at the shul. And I felt so wonderful to be back oh, at the shul. Right. You know, I'm yeah. so proud of the Bayat. Just, you know, I can't, yeah. you know, I get emotional when I think about it because it's we're in such great hands. And uh, I think under Rev. Stevens' leadership, this has been the fine, and with all the difficulties, I think this has been the finest hour of the Bayit. And just like when I spoke to Charlotte's daughters and they were so overwhelmed by preparations, and I said to them, Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry. Just make one phone call to Rav Stephen, to Bracha, Ezra, and it's all done. And that's exactly what happened. And Joel Simon, Joel Simon, uh, just God bless him. So I know going back to the shul must be very uplifting. I miss the shul. It was very the... emotional, actually. Very emotional for me. It was my first Shabbos here in the shul. Wow. And since before beautiful. COVID. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. But there'd be many more, God willing. And Joan, Thank Joan. You. Bezrat Lord, Hashem. Thank you. Hi, Joan. How are we doing? Hi. I'm doing very well. But I'd like you all to say a prayer for Phil Brief, who is in Israel and is suffering with COVID, even though he had his third shot. So wow. please say yeah. your prayers. Wow. Now, because we can we can reach out to them. Joan, yes. do you know where they are? Is he hospitalized? He was 
He was hospitalized yesterday. I'm not sure if he is there today or home, but you can reach out to Clara. If you need her uh, email or phone number, I can send it. Oh, if you could, I'd be most or appreciative. Or on WhatsApp, I shall. If you, could, what, if you could WhatsApp to me, I'd be so appreciative. Clara had sure. that great line, um, like on the 30th anniversary of our Ravenet Joan. Do you remember what she wrote? She said, no, I don't. Uh, the 30th anniversary of our being in Riverdale, she wrote something like, I've changed countries, I've changed husbands, but I'm not changing my rabbi. Oh. One of the best lines. <laughs> I've changed countries. <laughs> yeah, I always think about that. That was a great line. Graham, how are you doing, my Graham? Fine, thank you very much. Uh, very happy so to be here, to be with you. And you, you, uh, you. I so appreciate your thoughtfulness, Graham. Always, always, always. Yeah, Just my pleasure. You. Definitely. But speaking of age, like I always say, you're only as old as you are. Right. You're only as old as you are. And Fern, how are you doing? Doing fine. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, I had two thoughts that I wanted to just share. Um, sure. How I, every day I try to do something fun because it's, the situation is still really not normal here. But right. I think a fun, we did it last week with my mom. We went to the um, New York Botanical Gardens. And I think people in Riverdale, if you haven't been lately, there's an exhibition there now from Kusama, uh, the Japanese artist that makes all of those polka dotted sculptures. It's phenomenal. And it's gonna be finished on the 31st of this month. Um, this is not a, a pitch for them, but it's just a fun thing to do. And they have a trolley that you could get on so you could go all around the grounds with the trolley. And it's really a lovely way to spend an afternoon. So that's what I wanted to share. <laughs> Thank you, Fern, thank you. And uh, I see Carol's on, Carol Oshinsky's on. I'm sure Sai is not, not far away. Hmm. Hi, Carol. And, and Rita, how are you doing, Rita? I'm okay. I, I thought you, you missed me. <laughs> no, no, I, no, I no, Actually, no. I missed you because I was looking in the shul for you. I was in the shul and I didn't see you when I, I in fact, I asked, James, where where you are, but um, I'm we're, glad we're that still you're... In, we're still in Jerusalem. And... We're in Israel now. That's yeah. where I'm, I'm. I'm actually talking from from the from Jerusalem, so it's great. Bye. And uh, wow, a lot of people are on. Joyce, how are you doing? I'm all right. Thank you very much. And Joyce, thanks for your help on. Um, on Charlotte, and I think it's all set. Joyce, Joyce has played a major, major role, and thank you for alerting me to what what was unfolding. I appreciate it very much. Well, I'm how are you doing? How are you doing, Joyce? I'm doing fine. I'm all right. Thank good, 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 good. And uh, Robert's on. Always getting people Hi, to invest Mario. in Israel. How are you doing, Robert? Doing good. Still working from home until we let people come up to the office or any of the synagogues let us have some events again. I understand that Rabbi Stephen is working with uh, with uh, Bob Kalfas and uh, and and the Fetmans to try to do something at the Hanukkah. Are you aware or not aware of that? I, I heard um, rumblings about that, which is very good. Has okay. Bonds taken a hit from COVID? In general, uh, or? no. Last year, I, I mentioned to you the other month uh, we did better than ever. But uh, you know, we have a very senior population, and our whole focus is uh, right now on, on new leadership mainly. That the that new generation should understand that we're not a charity, and uh, they should invest in uh, in what they believe in. Right. You know, and for as little as a hundred dollars, you can claim you know be part of anyone's honor roll. How long yes. will you be in Israel? I'm heading there next Saturday night. How long will you be there? 
We're supposed to leave on the 7th, but we'd like to leave a week and a half later if we can. I just have to work out wedding scheduling and things like that. But but till the okay. 7th, God willing. Okay. So All right. we, well, maybe we'll, we'll meet at the airport on the 7th. Yeah, pick me up we at the airport. <laughs> I arrive at the airport at 2 o'clock on the 7th. <laughs> right. Hi, Ruth, right. how are you doing? It's great to see you. How are things? Hi. Kids okay? Uh, you're on mute. You have to just unmute yourself. Unmute. Okay, fine. There you I'm go. On phone. <laughs> I'm on my phone, so I wasn't sure. Yeah, everyone, we're, we're managing. We're managing. Good, good. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, yep. Yeah. Yep. That's all you do. <laughs> You're making me yep. so jealous. I want to be in Israel also. <laughs> Israel is, it's really. I'm hoping I get there one day. Yeah. It's so I'm hoping. beautiful. Um, it's not that Israel doesn't have issues, it does. Oh, it's, we know. I know. I mean, oh, one of the boy. major issues in Israel is everybody you know, has their own little place amongst the Jewish community and is not enough talking to each other and, and listening mm -hmm. to each other and all I of know. that. And then the demographic issue here is a very serious issue, I think. And you know, how you maintain, how you remain a Jewish state, and, but at the same time, a democratic state, it's, it's not so simple. It really okay. very is very, very challenging. And back home, I just saw today that Bauman he is so predictably against Israel. I must say that. I've never been afraid to call someone out on that, but he, for example, the Israeli government has designated six uh, Palestinian human rights organizations as, as the, their human rights advocacy is a cover for their terroristic relationship with the PFLP. And it's created a big stir here and also in the United States because the United States government does not believe that they're a terrorist organization. And frankly, I think Israel's, Israel's secret service and Israel's understanding of these organizations, if I have to choose between American know-how or Israeli know-how when it comes to understanding the Middle East, it's no contest for me, Israel, Israel knows, knows better. But right away, Bauman, predictably, he just announced that how dare Israel be critical of human rights organizations. And mm. you know, I just know, I know what he's gonna say relative to Israel before he says it. And uh, it's very disturbing, very disturbing. Well, how, could, how can we vote to get rid of him? After all, the people- well, the, 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 real, the real answer to that, Estelle, is the bottom line is, it's just getting to, to real tactics is we need somebody who has a chance of winning, who can run against him. That's what, that's what this is all right. about. Right. Uh, I have approached a few people, especially in the African-American community and the Hispanic community. And uh, I hope someone will, will step forward, but that's what's critically critically necessary. And a lot of people have been swept up by his aggressive stances, but still his anti-Israel bias is very, very, very disturbing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think I'm gonna write a piece on that, you know, just to try to, to prove, you know, in paragraph after paragraph where I, I think he's terribly mistaken. Having said that, let me begin uh, with Chaye Sarah, and this is the chapter where it begins with a discussion of, of Sarah's life. As a matter of fact, that had been the discussion in previous, in previous portions. And it opens up by saying, Vayihiyu Chaye Sarah, and the years of Sarah's life, how many years did she live? And so I'm reading from the text now, Meyashana, a hundred years. 
And then it says, the Esrim Shana and 20 years, the Sheva Shanim and seven years, Shnei Chaye Sarah, the years of Sarah's life. Now, for the student of, of the Bible, there are a lot of extra words in this first sentence. It says that Sarah's years were a hundred years and 20 years and seven years. And then as if we didn't get the message, the years of Sarah's life. And the commentators are perplexed. Why is there so much repetition? There's a reiteration of years, a hundred years, 20 years, seven years. Why didn't it just say she was 127 years old? How old was she? She was Meyave Esrim, the Sheva Shanim. That's it. Say it, Oshana, say it straight out. What's this 100 years and 20 years and seven years? And the classic commentaries say the following. They look at this text and they're trying to just methodologically, they're bothered by this question. So when you look at this methodologically, the careful reader wonders about this because there should be no extra words in the Torah. What do these extra words teach? Now, I think if you went into the world of scholarship, I think the scholars would say, well, this is a text that is not so careful with the usage of words. Maybe it comes from a particular era. And in that era, this is the way of, of talking. This was, this was the jargon. And yes, this is this text. Maybe it's a damaged text. There are other texts. So don't get too excited. Don't get too upset by the repetition of years, years, years. And I hear that. And I think it's very important that we take that in and we consider that approach. But the classical traditional approach looks at this and says, wait a minute, why the extra years? And it sees the text as having a holiness. It has a sanctity, it has a kedusha. And this is what the rabbi said. I'm gonna present it to you and then I'm gonna present another approach. The rabbis say that the reason why years are mentioned over and over is that uh, at a hundred years old, when Sarah became older, if you would have asked her this question, how old would you like to be? She would say, me, I would like to be much younger. And the rabbis say it in a very, in a in a very exaggerated way. They say not only would she have said, I would like to have been younger, but in fact, when you looked at Sarah at a hundred years old, she was as beautiful at a hundred years old as she was at 20. At a hundred years old, she was as beautiful as at 20. And then they continue and say, that at 20 years old, when everybody is out there to conquer the world and all kinds of associations, and we think back to our younger years and we do the stuff that youth does. So the rabbis say, ah, not Sarah. Sarah, at 20 years old, she was as pure in the way she carried herself as when she was seven years old. Now, I think by the time we're seven, there could be a little bit of mischievousness, but there is something about young children. There is an innocence and there is a purity. So this is the way I was brought up with this traditional comment. It's a comment in the Midrash and it is quoted by the great Rashi of the 11th century. This is what he says. Let me see if I can find it. He says, Lekach nichtav shana the, the reason it says seven after the hundreds numbers and the tens and the singles, he says it very beautifully to teach you that 
each shana requires its own exposition. It needs its own exegetical comment. And that's the comment. At 100, she was as beautiful as at 20. At 20, she was as beautiful as at 70. I was thinking that maybe we should look at this actually in the very opposite way. Now, I've not seen this anywhere, but I want to put this out there for your consideration. The reason why years, years, years are mentioned over and over is the following. At 100 years, that is to say, when she reached her senior years, she didn't wish that she was younger. When she was a senior, she embraced becoming older. And at 100, and it doesn't just mean 100, when she got older, 60, 70, 80, 90, even 100 these days is not unusual. When she reached those senior years, she didn't fight it. She tried to grow older in an elegant way. And she lived her senior years as a senior. She didn't want to dress at 100 as if she was 20. She didn't dress herself up, make up herself as if she was 20. There's a beauty. There's a beauty to aging. Here, I'm talking to myself and letting you listen because this is not, this is something we've spoken about in the past. This is not the American way. America is very, very focused on youth, extremely focused on youth. And I think this is the way it is in Western civilization. And my contention is that America is a very commercial country. And while it is true that when people become seniors, they could you know, go into a, a senior assisted living place or whatever, but the truth of the matter is real money is not made from older people. And that's why when one considers the, the, commercial, the, the commercial possibilities of aging in, in the West, young people spend much more. If you look at the commercials, that's why the commercials in general are directed to younger people. This, by the way, in great contrast to what happens in, in Eastern, uh, in Asian countries where the elderly are, the seniors are venerated. Do you know, I don't know if you know this, I've not seen it, but in Israel, when people are online at a takeout store, they're going into a, a, a Walgreen, a Wal, whatever they're called, bounds, into a large grocery store. I think by law, a senior, can jump the line by law. It lives the principles of, wait a minute, respect has to be shown for a person who has reached that age. So I want to argue that at a, the opposite of what the rabbis say, it's not that at 100, she was as beautiful as Look, at 20. I, at 100, she was as beautiful as when she was 100. That's how beautiful she was. And there's great beauty as people grow older. And at 20, she lived fully as a 20 year old. She didn't want to live like she was 50 and she didn't want to carry herself like she was a young teeny bopper. She was 20, she was 25, she was 30. And at seven, that's a beautiful, you know, we look at children and we say to, oh my goodness, this child's going to be something when this child grows up. I oh, hear it now. I hear it, but there is great, great Sorry. beauty to being five and six and seven and, and living that fully. So let me just summarize. Whereas the rabbis say that the proliferation of years teaches that at a particular age, she was as good as if she was another age. We're saying the reverse, that at a particular age, and it's a lesson, of trying to embrace the time that we are living, the moment that we are living in, rather than trying to be someone else or somewhere else or at a different time, to recognize we are where we are and embrace it 
And I'd go so far as to say and to celebrate it as best as we could. Meyashana Vesrim Shana Vesheva Shanim. I want to stop here and I want to get your reaction. I'm trying to do texts that don't require us to put anything on the board, but I want to get your reaction. Yes, Ruth. I just wanted to say that I never had to stand in line at Trader Joe's, the grocery store. I'm always invited to go to the head of the line. Really? Yes, that's Trader Joe for you. Right. An exception. Good for Trader Joe. I think Carol, I saw you were nodding your head when we were talking about this, Carol. You're on mute, um, Carol. <laughs> uh, yes, well, you know, it, it's nice to be respected. And yet you have a little bit of pr uh, pride yet um, that you're still able-bodied and you don't need to be pushed to the head of the line. Yeah, no, there is like every, Carol, you're so right. Like, you know, and, and I think any concept that makes sense has a side of vulnerability and, and that's true. Like um, when seniors now can get on uh, public transportation for half price, it's, it's, a, it's a nice gesture, but if seniors, because they pay half price, begin to think that they can only contribute 50%, that could get problematic because once we think that there's less that we can give, we're gonna think less of ourselves and it's, uh, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. So one has to watch that. And uh, Carol Grayby, I, I saw you were nodding your head too. I like what you say. I like what you said about about the advertisement of years younger people. You very, very rarely see older person in an advertisement. You also really rarely see an, a heavier person in an advertisement. Everybody is made to look perfect. So right. for a while, that's how everyone should look. And you're so true. Like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, Natalie and then Estelle. Me too, Avi. <laughs> and then uh, Arnie, of course. Natalie, go ahead. It seems. How old was she when she be, when she had the first her child? She was, believe it or not, ninety years old. So those 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 hundred years were one thing, and then. The years that she was raising the child was like seven separate years, and her life was like in 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 oh, portions. I like that. That's beautiful, Natalie. Thank you. Thank um, you. If, if I if I can say something, it, yes, I, I think it's not a particularly in a in a country. Uh, it, it's the individual person. I'll tell you frankly. Uh, in the early 50s, when we were living in Israel, and there were long lines for everything, and I was yes. sitting standing in a long line, say half hour, and this older woman comes in the front, and she said, and I said, you know, in my best Hebrew, and uh, she said, oh no, I, since I'm older, they told me that I could go to the front. And I said to her, I don't care if you're a Hottentot. I've been waiting a half, you know, half an hour online and you're not getting on in front of me. I mean, that's basically it. But I know in this country, if we're, co if we're, if we're old, elderly, it's usually the teenagers who get up to give us a seat or to get to put us in online. It just depends on the individual person. And I would not, after waiting in half hour or an hour online, I would not be happy to have, I don't care if the person is 102, to have to get on ahead of me. I, I, it's just a personal feeling. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. You, know, the, you know what they say about Israel? There is no straight line. Everything <laughs> is in circles. And uh, that's the way it is in Israel. <laughs> yes, Arnie. <laughs> So uh, I want to pick up on Natalie's statement. So at 100, Sarah was the mother of a 10-year-old. She was busy taking Isaac to soccer practice and piano lessons and uh, everything else. And, and you know, I don't think she had 
too much time to really reflect back on the, the breadth of her life. In the next 20 years, rather than looking at the 20 as a 20 year old, like Natalie did, I see it in stages sequentially going forward. In the next 20 years, Isaac grew up, got out of the house. Well, I don't know if he got out of the house, <laughs> but, but he grew up at least. And, and maybe she had more of a reflective time. And the last seven years, Seven is significant, it's a completion, it's a, a fullness. And, and while, while I'm saying that, I'm mindful of the text in the Torah, which indicates that maybe her life was not so full and complete at the end between the Akeda and her strains with uh, Avraham, her husband, uh, maybe perhaps feeling whether it was guilt or some unresolved feelings about banishing Hagar and Ishmael. So that's another way I, I'm it's, looking uh, at it. It's, I, I, you know, maybe I have to tell Shuli we got to pull out the manuscript and <laughs> Natalie and your thought, because it's, it is something. I like the way, you know, you both said it, uh, she was going to soccer practice. So she was, she kept young. And then the 20 is because, you know, I'm closer to 80 than 70, but I, I do stay young because I'm surrounded at Cholive, at Marat by young people. Mm -hmm. I think it was Elmer Roosevelt who said that the trick to staying young is surrounding yourself by young people. Although our comment was it's okay to, it's okay to be older, but I, I, I like that uh, something to think about it that she, her life was unusual. At, at 90, she, she has a child. It's, the, it's, it's quite extraordinary. I'll share one more thought on the Parsha because this, this is the Parsha where Abraham sends out his steward, Eliezer, to find a wife for, uh, for, for Isaac, for his son, his second son, Isaac. Sarah's only son. By the way, uh, what you just said, Arnie, there's, there, there, is, there is discussion about was um, Sarah and Abraham's relationship strained. I know that in certain circles, the, the, the patriarchs and matriarchs led lives of perfection, but there's another way to look at it, that they, they led human lives and as human beings, they, they did struggle. And Nachmanides actually hints at this. He touches it, but then he steps back. He says, look, the, we're told that after the binding of Isaac, Abraham went back to a place called Be'er Sheva, which is in the South. And here we're told in Chaye Sarah that Sarah died in Hebron. Wait a minute. And then it says, by Yavo Abraham, Abraham came. It, it would seem that he came from Beersheba to Hebron to bury his wife. So he puts it out there. Does that mean that they were living in, in different places? And uh, Midrash, they talk about, okay, God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son. You know, he had more than one son. Sarah had only one son. Did he share it with his wife? We, we often talk about what was Abraham feeling when he took Isaac to be slaughtered. And we've gone through this, we've spent a lot of time on that chapter. What was Isaac feeling? We actually try to argue that Abraham misunderstood God. God never told Abraham to slaughter his son, but I don't wanna go there. But there's another principle. There's not just Abraham and Isaac, there is, Sarah, Sarah's the mother. Did Abraham share with Sarah that he was going, that, that he was following God's command to get her, to get her opinion? What, what does she think about this? I mean, after all, in the prior story, it was Sarah who wanted Ishmael to, 
to be expelled, but it was Abraham who said no. And so they were involved. However, we understand that narrative here. What about Sarah? And there was one rabbinic comment, one midrash, the, the rabbis say that Sarah was never told, never told by God, never told by Abraham. And in a very dramatic narrative, the rabbis say, and, and I'm, who knows whether this is true. It, it may not be true, but I always say in a medrash, it's the teaching. They say that some, someone came to Sarah and whispered in her ear, do you know where Abraham is? Abraham has gone to slaughter your son. And before the, this messenger had a chance to say, but thank God he's still alive. She was so shocked by that information that that is what caused her death. Now, I, I don't actually think it happened that way, but it could be that this really alienated Sarah from, from Abraham. So the impact of the Akedah on their relationship is something to think about. In the end, however, Abraham, in the first chapter of Chai Sarah buries his wife. And in the next chapter, almost as if Abraham now realizes that the continuity of the covenant will be through Isaac and not through Ishmael, something that we've also discussed at nauseum, he sends his steward Eliezer to find a wife for Isaac. And he sends him back to his hometown. So he goes back to the Mesopotamia area. And he goes back and he is at a well, or he's at a place where camels, they're able to drink from troughs from where there is, from where there is water. And in chapter 24, he says something like this, Vayomar and Eliezer said, and he says to God the following, look, what kind of wife would Abraham want for Isaac? Obviously, a woman who was kind, who was considerate. And he says, look, whoever comes out, when a woman comes forth, I'm going to ask her for something to drink. I'm going to tell her I'm thirsty. The woman who will not only give me to drink, but will also say I want to feed and give water to the camels, Ota, she is the one, she is the chosen one who's worthy of, of Isaac. By the way, it's not uncommon that love stories in the Bible take place at water. It's invariably correct. Rebecca is found at the troughs at the water when Jacob is running from his brother Esau and he sees Rachel. Where does he see Rachel? The water. He lifts the stone off the well. How does Moses meet his wife, one of the seven daughters of Yitro of Jethro? He sees that they're taking advantage of at the water and he steps in and he stops. He stops advances being made towards them. Water is love. You can't live without water and it is very difficult to live life without love, without relationship, without community, without family. Yes, without intimacy, without, without love. So he's at, he's at this place of the water and he says, whoever is not only going to give me to drink, but is going to give the animals to drink. This is the one, I'm quoting it by heart, I'm not sure I got it exactly, but this is the woman who is certainly for Isaac. And Rebecca comes, and that is exactly what unfolds. Now, I wanna offer two questions, that's one question. When Isaac, excuse me, when Eliezer, the steward, is at the well, and he turns to God and says, I need your help. Whoever is going to do this for me is going to give me to drink and the animals. This is the woman of kindness 
who is appropriate for Isaac. The word there is, the first word, the opening word is Vayomar and he said. Now, each of the words in the Torah has what's called the trop, which is a cantillation sign. And the cantillation sign, some say that it, it when exactly it goes back to is a subject of a lot of discussion, but certainly there are many, including the great Gaon of Vilna, arguably one of the smartest geniuses in all of Jewish history. I think he was in the 18th century. So he says that the cantillation, this is Bernie Horowitz territory, the way we sing, the ancient way of singing the trap, the singing is a commentary on, on what is unfolding. And so when Eliezer speaks, it says, Vayomar, and he said, and on top of the word Vayomar is a cantillation sign called a shalshelet. You can all say it together, shalshelet. Shalshelet comes from the word shalosh, three. And it is three pazers. What is a pazer? A pazer is the highest note in singing a word from the Torah. The next time you're in synagogue and you hear how the Torah is being read from Bernie and others, you'll see that there's a certain trap, a certain cantillation sing song. Now the pazer goes like this. Pazer, it goes up and down. The shalshelet, if you will, is three pozers. So on the word vayomar, it would be something like this. Up and down, up and down up and down. And would you believe it, the commentary on that cantillation is that when you listen to the cantillation, when you listen to that music, so Hirsch, who lived in the 19th century, says, whenever you find a shalshelet, whatever we're talking about, it's a statement of hesitation. Hesitation. The most famous one is when Mrs. Potiphar, the Mrs. Robinson of the Torah. We have a Mrs. Robinson in the Torah. Do you remember the graduate and Mrs. Robinson? What the graduate says to Mrs. Robinson, he wakes up and he says, Mrs. Robinson, we're sleeping with each other night in and night out. I don't even know your first name. What is your first name? That's why she's always Mrs. Robinson. Good morning, Mrs. Robinson. Will you sleep with me, Mrs. Robinson? He says, we're with each other. What's your name? Da, da, Mrs. Ro <clears throat> we have our Mrs. Potiphar. And Mrs. Potiphar, the Bible's Mrs. Robinson, tries to seduce Yosef. And she was probably, as my father would say, a beauty. And it says that Yosef refused. And the Hebrew biblical word for refused is vayimo'en. And he said, no, vayimo'en, mi'en. Would you believe it that on top of the vayimo'en is which cantillation sign? Guess what? The shalshelet. So it goes like this. Vayimo'en. What's that about? Well, what they say is, basically he was saying, maybe yes, maybe <laughs> no, oh, I'm not sure if I, he hesitated. The rabbis actually say that he was ready to give in, but he looked up at the window. This is a Talmud in Soto, the Ra'a cluster Panov Shel Aviv. He saw, Joseph looked up, and he saw the figure of his father. He saw his tradition. He doesn't really mean he saw his father, but he saw the tradition of the past, the ethics of the past. That's what saved him. And he said, no, my teacher, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, 
when he wrote his magnum opus called Ishalacha, and he offered his understanding of Jewish law. On the first page, it's an empty page, except for what I just quoted. Joseph looked up and he saw his father's facial features. That was the way Joseph Soloveitchik wrote, what I'm writing now. Yes, I'm writing it, but it was very influenced by my father. I mean, to this day, after my father's death, I can, I can feel my father tapping me on the shoulder these past few years and saying, are you sure this is what you want to do, Avrami? Are you positive? Is this what you want to do? On top of the Vayamain is a hesitation. So that hesitation I understand. But why should Eliezer hesitate? That's my question. I'll come to the second point, which I said is part of the question. That's part of the answer, if you will. But I want to put it out there. In this text, Eliezer comes to find a wife for Isaac, his master's son. You would think he should do it with alacrity. My Abraham has asked me to do this. Of course, I'm going to do it without hesitation. But certainly in this text, he seems to, to be saying, look, I want a woman who is kind. And he, and he says what he says but there is a hesitation. Why should he be hesitating? Yeah. That's my question. Yeah. Yes, Tova, Tova, I know it's uh, gonna uh, hit uh, it on the nail. Of course he has to hesitate because doesn't he always have to think, why did he send me? Why didn't he send his son to find his own wife? Right, that's a great he question. Sent, that sent could his be son. And by the way, by the way, there are two classic stories of finding a wife in Sefer Breshit, Tova. The first is a shatran, right? Mm -hmm. He was a shatran. There's a second story. Maybe Jacob learned from the past, or maybe Isaac learned from the past. Isaac says, Jacob, you go out and find a wife. I'm not going to send someone to bring a wife to you. Two different styles. The Isaac marrying Rebecca was a Shatchan style. As a matter of fact, the text in Chai Sarah says they got married and then they loved yeah, each other. Yeah. They didn't even love each other before. And the text about Jacob and Rachel, it says Jacob saw Rachel and immediately uh, Debbie has her hands so softly on Arnie's shoulders. Immediately there was a love. Immediately they fell in love. And, and Toba. Just to add to what you're saying, maybe they learned from it. Maybe that's not, maybe that was the hesitation. And but he like, says, you know, Jacob, I don't want you to do it the same way. Okay, but we have to also remember that who really sent out Yaakov? It was his mother. Ah, okay. Okay. So maybe we Great. have to learn from that. Absolutely. Any other thoughts on why perhaps the hesitation, Natalie? Because he's making a very life-saving decision and he's not sure, is this the right thing? Right. Absolutely. Rabbi? Absolutely. Yes. How old was she? How old uh, was she? It's, it's, I, look, I know you're probably referring to the Medrash that says right. she was three years old. She was that, not three years old. That could be No, that she be probably, <laughs> most would say she was in her early 20s. Okay. And uh, how old Isaac was is, it's, it's, she was probably 10 years. Yeah. 10 years younger. Yes, Vivian, you're gonna yeah. give us um, another great I, answer. I, I, I have a, um, an idea that uh, I learned from Rabbi Sol Berman from whom yes. I learned a great deal when I was at the JCC. And he has a theory that, um, that Yitzchak, that Isaac was not quite fully developed in, intellectually, that he was perhaps backward. And, um, and maybe that's why uh, he couldn't go by himself and make a choice. And, and uh, uh, he, they had to had right. send someone else to go. So, Vivian, uh, something I, that years I ago. I know that that's theory. That was, no, no, it's great. That, now, that 25 was year, now, 25 years ago, I gave it to Torah, and yeah. I wrote it up. 
And I argued that while, maybe we'll talk about this next week, that while Isaac did not have downs, when you look chapter after chapter of the way he carried himself, he had the characteristics of downs. In mm. fact, he was born when his mother was, was much older. Mm -hmm. And then I said that this thought was a thought I first heard from my dear, dear friend, Rabbi Saul Berman. Yeah. And I learned something from that because I don't know if you remember, some of you may remember that I think I was excommunicated. Yeah. As people were saying, <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> that Isaac had Downs and, and Shalom, one of my dearest friends in the world, and said, Avi, why'd you have to quote me? You didn't quote me exactly right. So every time I, I write something and I want to say I really heard this from someone else, but often I take it and I tweak, tweak it and take it to the next radical step. I said, when, when I put this in, this thing is in the book too. I said, I don't think Rabbi Berman wants to be associated with the way I'm presenting this. But, but that theory was a theory I heard from him too. And he's, yeah. he's such a remarkable man, Vivian. And I know that yes, he was I, your, he was your scholar in residence at the JCC. Yes, he was. For, and he was, he was my Rebbe for a long time. Afterward, I had uh, Rabbi Kimmelman, who was equally Right. Friendly. Kimmelman yeah. and uh, Daniel. Ruven uh, Kimmelman. And yeah. then after was Daniel Hartman, right? And No, he was earlier, actually. He was earlier. Daniel Hartman was practically a child when he came. He was a very young man. I worked very closely with him. That was quite a group. Yeah. Arnie, thank you. Dave. I was very honored at yes. this time. Yes. So um, I know you've taught in the past that Eliezer perhaps thought that he was Avraham's heir. And that could have been why there was um, hesitation. Whoa. But I, I just, one other thing that's sort of a little bit of a digression. When you were talking about water and love, to me, it's very ironic, almost funny, that as we get older, the water in our body dries up, yet the love that we have increases. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Right. Can I? Can I ask? We've, we've been, Arnie. We've been nurtured by the water. Maybe that's mm -hmm. is what sustains us. But I, I love that thought as usual. Just. Um, mm -hmm. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thought. So I, just to stop, if I may, just for a moment, Arnie, um, going back to what Arnie said, you're uh -huh. right, Eliezer, whose name could be very suitable for to be the second patriarch. What does Eliezer mean? It's a composite of El Ozer, God helps. That's a nice uh -huh. name. It's a, by the way, it's a better <clears throat> name than the talk. What is the, the second patriarch? Give me a break. It's called laugh. I will laugh. Eliezer. That's that's mm. a name. God will help. And there was a certain point where God says to Abraham, how are you doing? And Abraham says, <laughs> you know, this going back, he says, yeah, things are great. But Eliezer, uh, uh, Abraham was the kind of person who I know such people who have everything and have nothing. There are people mm. who have that, everything. That, that's my question. How did Abraham and Sarah get together? Yeah, well, we're, 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 I'm, if I may, I'm going to, how did they get together? They were really of the same family. Sarah was Abraham's yeah. niece. Yes, Sarah, I know, but, but still, Sarah was the daughter was of his there, brother, Haran. I, I'm aware of that, but was there ever any indication of feeling for each other? Or was it just togetherness or because no, they, right. they, they had nobody else? Maybe the there's no relationship between yeah, them at all. Yeah. Well, the first indication of togetherness is they get down to Egypt. And he says to her, Abraham says I know says you're my her, sister. No, he says, Hine no yodati ki Behold, now I know that you're beautiful. I remember studying this with Toby and she said, you know what? She should have slapped him in the face. Now he knows that she's beautiful. They've been living together for 25 years. She should have said to him, where have you been for 25 years? You know? But, I, well, but maybe, that's the first maybe time. That's, why, that's not the only that's reason she should have slapped him. 
<laughs> well, you know what I'm saying? Maybe that's why she had no children because maybe they never got together. Okay, I I wasn't there, so I uh, it it does say <laughs> the text does way. go out of its way to say the Sarah Akara that she was barren. It does say that, even though sometimes barren, you wonder is it her or is it him. Well, he they probably never looked at her that oh, he way. He had Ishmael. Yeah, he did well, have Ishmael. But she was, well, probably uh, Hagar was more attractive than Sarah. Maybe right. that was his first relationship. Right. I, I'm only Estelle, questioning. Estelle, um, I, I, Estelle, I love you as usual. You've taken me on a very beautiful tangent. But for a moment, <laughs> I want to just Abby, can I, pull can back. I, yes, Abby, yes, sir. I just wanted to say that I respectfully disagree with you on one point. Please. I think Isaac is a much better name than Elias because through all, I agree. Adversity, through all the adversity that we face, we always have the DNA that will laugh. I love that. <laughs> I, I want to say no, you're I, right I, and wrong. I like that I, a lot. I, I like that. I agree yes, with Arnie, but with for different reasons. Because first, Abraham left, and God named the child Yitzchak. God laughed, but who had the last laugh? It was Sarah. Right. Good. But, I mean, but God named him. Right. And, and I, and I think that's a God does name Sarah him. that he's named and, Yitzchak. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and Arnie, how else could we have made it? If, if, and Yitzhak, it doesn't mean, Yitzhak literally, the Yud puts it into the future tense. It's almost a way of saying the only way we're going to make it is you got to know how to laugh. You got to know how to kind of, this was Sharansky's great strength. I think one of Sharansky's strength is, and, and we just heard him, I just had dinner with uh, Avital and Natan. He never forgot how to laugh. You know the story about him when, um, when they remember when he crossed the bridge, and he walked across was it the Belinka Bridge from East Germany to West Germany. So the Russians, the Soviets, didn't want him to go out in a prison uniform, so they gave him a pair of pants. So so when he crosses, there was one reporter who says to him, Natan, what were you thinking about when you crossed the bridge? Were you thinking about Avital? She was waiting for you. You had not seen her in, in 12 years. Were you thinking about Israel? Were you thinking about, you know, God? He says, you know, they gave me this pair of pants. It was so loose. All I could say was I turned to God. I said, please, God, make sure my pants don't fall down. There are a lot of cameras in front of me. This is Sharansky. He never forgot how to laugh. But, um, but I want to just go back and I want to finish with this and say that that there is really a teaching that Eliezer asked by God to find a wife for Isaac was acting against his best interests because if he would not succeed on his mission, he was a candidate to be the second patriarch. Abram at one point, when God says, how are you doing? He says, look, at this point, my only heir, this goes back in the story, is Damasic Eliezer. It's Eliezer from Damascus. So Eliezer, if he wouldn't succeed, well, he could have been the second heir. Or the rabbis say it this way. The rabbis say, when Eliezer heard from Abraham that he wants him to find a young woman for Isaac, Eliezer was thinking, I also have a daughter. What about my daughter? I got another shidduch, Abraham, my own daughter. And so maybe, maybe he hesitated because it was natural for him to hesitate. He was being asked to do something. Most of us do what we do because it's in our interests. They say, Adam Karov Latzmo. Adam Karov Latzmo. A person is close to himself. Whenever people try to evaluate a certain incident, people ask, what's in it for that person? 
What is, what's, what's, what's the attachment? Well, frankly, there was nothing in it for Eliezer on some level. Yes, there was to obey his master, but it really was not in his best interest. That's why he's hesitating. And that's why in chapter 24, we assume that it was Eliezer, the steward of Abraham, who went to find a wife for, for, uh, for Isaac. But not once is he mentioned as being Eliezer. He is called the emissary of Abraham. He's called uh, the person who follows Abraham's orders. As a matter of fact, when he gets to Laban's house, this is Rebecca's brother, and they say, who are you? And he says right there, you'll read through chapter 24 this week of Genesis, Vayomar, it's the same Vayomar, the same word of the hesitation. He says, Eved Avraham Onochi. I am Abraham's servant. That's all. He doesn't, he has no name. He doesn't even say my name. His name is nowhere mentioned because he's not acting for his name. He's not acting for himself. And I think he deserves, he's one of those minor characters who deserves a lot of credit, a lot of credit, because he was the key shotgun and he played a very important role. And in succeeding, he really was they doing have... that which was not best for himself. Oh. And I think what this also shows is that sometimes when we do things, yeah. it's understandable that we're doubting, we're hesitating, that's okay. It's not always that we act and we're absolutely certain. He had a certain uncertainty. And yet with the uncertainty, he had, he had great success. I want to open it up for your comments and then we'll, we'll call it a, a morning or an afternoon. Um, Anyone? I, I wanted to say something. Yes, Linda, please. Um, I think that, he's, um, that Isaac is very shell-shocked because of what happened with Abraham. And maybe he was very afraid to go out on his own to look for a wife because look, he went with his father and his father almost killed him. So this emissary was sent in his place because yes. he didn't have success with going out and doing something. Beautiful. That's what happened. That's beautiful. I'm very moved by that. Thank uh, you. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, Linda, when we offer these interpretations, you know, think that we're taking away from the from the the godliness of the Torah. No, for me, godliness is is an understanding of the human condition. This is godliness too, and and that's the way God operates. It's not that these Isaac was a very very great man, a very great man, but he was a man, and and as the person who was taken out and it, just as you said maybe he became shell-shocked he had a little bit of what do they call it ptsd right. and and he, and he couldn't get out there that's and that's okay given all that he went through he he still carried himself in a very beautiful way you know i've always felt that you know god operates now in three ways all the way back he operated in a supernatural way then I think God stepped back and the miracles that occurred were hidden miracles. Now God still operates, but you know, for me, when I look at technology, when I look at the internet, which has the capacity to do terrible things, depending upon how we use it, but has the capacity to do great things. Mm -hmm. For me, that wisdom is a wisdom that comes not just from the human being, but from God. They say about, it was a great preacher, Emerson, Fosdick, something like that, that he once asked, astronomically, his words were, astronomically, what is man? When we think about man, we're each of us, we're so small compared to the world. You know, I saw a quote him, uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick, uh, told it was Joseph Lookstein in one of his books. Joseph Lookstein, of course, is a preacher's preacher. 
And he, he quotes Fostick as saying, astronomically, what is man? I would add, what is woman? We're so small. We look at the stars. The closest star we see is a star that was, the light that we see was lit four light years ago. Light travels at what? At the speed of 186,000. <laughs> I mean, what are we? We're so small. So what are we? We're nothing. So Fosdick says, astronomically speaking, what is man? And he answers, man is the astronomer. Think about that. Astronomically speaking, who are we? But yet, you know, it's the human being that's been creative. That's, and I think that creativity, I think it's a godly creativity. That's why I believe it's important. What I, I believe God works through people. And that too is a, is an expression of, it's, it's a reflection, a deep, deep reflection of God moving from the supernatural to the God who steps back to the God who's up there, but a God who works through, through people who, who want to do the godly thing and, and uh, do good, do good in this, do good in this world. So yeah, I, I think Linda, I think, um, I think the Torah is made up of the greatest of figures, godly people, but they were human. They were not uh, angels. They were not God, that's for sure. And, and I think that that's what marks us apart from other faith communities. J Jesus was infallible. Nothing that he can do wrong. That's why the Pope can't do wrong, but that doesn't, it, it doesn't work that way in our, in our Bible. And I see Bev and Ted, so it's so good to see you. Good to see you. Who's sitting near you, Ben? Hi, good to see you. Julia, the, Cal the California I Convention. See. I see, Hi. so good to see you. Thank How's you. Ted doing, Bev? Good. good, thank you for asking. Good, well, greetings to everyone from Israel. Bert, greetings to everyone. And I hope you've enjoyed it a 10th of the way I've enjoyed just listening to you and learning from you. It's really uh, a wonderful group on. And Shuli is reminding me that I have some kind of, Shuli, do I have a meeting with someone now? You so, may remember you're speaking to Yafa's fiance now. Oh, okay. Okay, the boss has spoken. <laughs> okay. Love Hi. you all. So before we hang up, I wanna give you from, um, from Jerusalem blessings, we say the Birkat Kohen, they take it very seriously here. The Kohen doesn't just do the benediction on the holidays, but every day and on Shabbat. And actually, uh, when I get under that talit as a Kohen, I, um, I know I say I'm blessing everyone, but I try to have as many of you in mind, and um, especially people who are not well, and I offer refuah shlema to you know, people who are a bit struggling. And so I want to bless you with uh, the blessing, Yivarechecha Adonai V'yishperecha Ya'er Adonai Pana Ve'lecha V'chuneka Yisa Adonai Pana Ve'lecha V'yasem Lecha Shalom. May God bless you and keep you, cause his light to shine upon you and grant you peace. And my favorite blessing is Kimalacha V'yitzavelach May God send his emissaries to be with you. May God guard and protect your going out and coming in forever. My blessings and love, we're on next week, God willing. Mm. Shalom, shalom. Although, although we're not coming, thank you, Rabbi. our blessings are with you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.